Hi. With me in the studio now is Naomi Novik. Naomi, welcome back to Fast Forward. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's been a while since uh, we've had you on last. I yeah. think we last time we was when we were at uh, Balticon a few yes, years ago. Yes, yes, that's right. And you have been a very busy lady. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You now have the fifth book in your right. Temeraire series, which has hit bestseller lists and things like that, and uh, been optioned by Peter Jackson. Yes. That must have been exciting. Just, you know, there was a little screaming running around the house <laughs> with the arms going like this, and, you know, yeah, it was, it's been pretty amazing. Yeah. And the new book is, you know, just, you're, you're keeping it going. It's a, it's a wonderful book. Uh, you really move things along in the story, and you really get into kind of the morality and personal consequences of war in this one. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because the first book, um, His Majesty's Dragon, really started out as kind of a, a lighthearted buildings roman, um, where Lawrence, you know, I, I was taking this naval captain, very much a man of his time, and throwing him into the deep end um, by making him suddenly become an aviator, suddenly get sucked into this completely different sort of subculture within his society that he wasn't used to. Um, and it was very much a sort of learning kind of heroic journey. Um, but more and more as I've continued with the series and gotten into the characters and their situations, the dragons, because the dragons are actually sort of characters, are people, um, even though they're not humans, uh, their concerns obviously have started to, to come to the forefront in a way. And that's really become kind of an interesting point to explore for me as well as, you know, hopefully for readers. Yeah, because there's a lot of the, the kind of politics mm -hmm. with the dragons in there, the, the way they're treated in different societies and in England where they have no rights and a lot of what was going on in the previous books and even in, and continues in this one is the dragons in England wanting to be treated as, I don't want to say people, but as intelligent creatures in their own right. Exactly. Exactly, yes. And so, you know, in this book we see a lot more of Temeraire, um, who having visited China and seen a completely different dragon society, uh, and had some of the sort of, um, I guess, common wisdom about dragons that is sort of held to be, you know, self-evident in a certain way in, in England. Um, he gets to China and sees, wait a second, that's not necessarily how it is. Uh, and that's one thing that I really enjoyed playing with through all the books, sort of as I explore different dragon societies and different um, human societies and how they relate to the dragons in their midst, um, is really kind of seeing how, how you know, all, our, all of us are, are I think, um, vulnerable to kind of making assumptions that the way that we see things, the way that we grow up with things around us is just the way they are. And sometimes when you sort of hit another culture, you suddenly realize that things you take for granted are completely different. And that's kind of the experience that Temeraire has had and that Lawrence has had. Mm -hmm. and, and also a lot of the other dragons, because in the earlier books you brought in some feral dragons mm -hmm. from with Central Europe. Exactly. And they're still here. Yep. Um, is Kerka? Ker is, is Kerka. Is Kerka is still there yes. and uh, throughout the book and, uh, you know, a very interesting character Excellent. in her own right. <laughs> Which reminds me, one of my favorite characters in the book is the dragon Persidia? Persidia. Persidia, <laughs> who is a fast, it's, this is a scientist dragon. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, I definitely wanted to introduce um, a, a dragon who could kind of be a little bit of a foil for Temeraire um, in the sort of intellectual department um, and show that it's not. Um, that it's not just Chinese dragons or celestial dragons that are necessarily intelligent um, on this higher level. That Persidia is a dragon who basically has not had any real sort of formal training. She's one of these kind of savants that you hear about sometimes in just in human society. Uh, somebody who found out enough about mathematics, um, learned enough to start to start exploring it on on their own and exploring science on their own. And she's kind of reinventing bits and pieces of science, despite the fact that she's never been trained. I love um, that, where she, she comes up with the Pythagorean theorem. Right, exactly. And then is angry. <laughs> yes, that somebody invented it before her. <laughs> she's extremely jealous of her, of her discoveries. But, uh, and, and she, unlike a lot of the other dragons, she doesn't want to fight, because it's yes. not logical to her. Yes, um, and, and I definitely wanted 
to get into that a little bit more, that's one of the things, of course, that in England, dragons are really considered good for only one thing, and that is to be beasts of war. Uh, and in other societies like China, um, dragons are much more allowed to be sort of what they want. Uh, they're allowed to have some sort of choice in their, in their lives, um, at least as much as people are in the time, which, you know, not necessarily huge. But, um, but Persidia is sort of a dragon who was born into a society where really her only option was to be, um, to go into the military, which she doesn't like. She's a little bit cowardly. Um, and in, in a very sensible way, I feel like a certain degree of cowardice is, is quite <laughs> rational, when it hasn't been explained to her what she's fighting for. And if it were explained to her, it would be, you know, why should I fight for you people when this is of no interest to me? And it makes no difference to me whether Napoleon rules England or you rule France. I still get fed. <laughs> um, so, so that's been kind of a, a fun character to explore. Yeah. Now, at the end of the previous book, you left Temeraire yes. and Will Lawrence in kind of hanging nasty, from a cliff. Hang, by their almost, claws. And hanging yes. is almost literal there because because yes. he had committed treason yes. and and been sentenced and separated from from Temeraire. Yes. And one of the things you do in here, which I thought was very interesting, was you explore the consequences of that act to other people. Yes. Um, you know, one of the things that um, uh, Lois McMaster Bujold very famously says that what you should do to your characters um, is think of the worst thing that you can possibly do to them. And there, there's your plot. Um, and the thing is, for Lawrence, death is not the worst thing that can happen to him in a lot of ways. Um, he's somebody who has went into the military at a very young age at the time. Um, you know, boys were going to, to the Navy at the age of 12 or 13, uh, sometimes even younger. And basically has grown up, I think, with the feeling that, you know, some, you sort of take your chances in a way, um, that he's not so much afraid to die. He risks his life kind of, that's his job, that's his duty. Um, and what is really kind of the worst thing that can happen to him is to feel that he has failed others, that he's failed in his duty. Uh, and exploring that um, is something that was really important to me because, you know, Lawrence is forced at the end of, of book four of Empire of Ivory to make really kind of a, a, a horribly painful moral choice oh, yeah. because neither of his options is very good. Um, and I, I feel that he makes the choice to sort of step outside of his nation, you know, to go past the kind of, you know, my country right or wrong and say, you know, I'm going to make the moral choice on a higher level um, to to save the dragons, basically, from, save dragons from genocide in a certain way. Right. And, but in course in doing so, he's at the same time betrayed a really deep and important part of himself that he would never have conceived of doing before he knew Temeraire. Um, and I wanted to explore the consequences of that to Lawrence emotionally um, and how he sort of, I think over the course of this book, comes to be at peace with his decision, um, but but it's not an easy journey. It's not an easy journey, and I felt very strongly that it shouldn't be, that it should right. not be. You know, Lawrence makes the heroic choice and is completely confident in what he's done and and moves forward because he's not. He no. he. You know, there's times in the book where he sits there and goes, "I did the wrong thing." Yeah, I did the wrong thing, and um, and I thought there was a. Uh, discussion between Jane, mm -hmm. who's, who's a female, yes. she's an admiral now. Yes, she's become an admiral. She's become an admiral in him, and he, when he went off at the, in Emperor of I, Ivory to, to save the dragons, he sent a note to yes. her and that she had to make public, and, and when she confronts him about what he did to her and that it could have been handled a different way. Yes, and you know, that conversation, um, I, I worked, quite a lot on that conversation because the thing is, Jane herself is actually quite honorable uh, and very much a good soldier and very much patriotic herself. Um, and so at the same time, you know, when she's speaking to Lawrence, she sort of says, you know, this could have been handled quietly and under the table and then she sort of takes it back a little bit, which I wanted that moment to be uh, a moment where Jane kind of acknowledges there was no good choice here at all. 
Um, but that her perspective is, Jane's, I think, more practical than Lawrence, uh, who's a bit more of an idealist and a romantic, uh, which is kind of an interesting uh, back and forth between them. But, uh, but that she's, she's also torn herself. Um, and she sort of wanted there to be a different solution without necessarily knowing what that other solution would have been. Right, right. Um, and, and they learn, and also Temeraire learns what has happened because of yes. what Will Lawrence did, that his old crew, yes. a lot of them don't want to work with him because he's, yes. he's the traitor and that exactly. Lawrence has lost all his capital. And exactly, yes. Things you like know, that. It's, and of course, we get to see how Temeraire's perspective on what is the worst thing that can happen to you is slightly different than yes. Lawrence's <laughs> perspective. You know, Temeraire is extremely horrified when he learns that Lawrence has lost something like 10,000 pounds <laughs> and, and is very, very upset. And Lawrence could not care less about right. the, the money at that point, of course. Uh, and that's sort of different different mores um, among dragons and people, obviously, uh, different preoccupations. Where, uh, and you know, that's that's quite a fun a fun thing to explore. And also, Temeraire, obviously, he suffers um, from the threat to Lawrence, um, but because he's not tied so closely to England, he's not patriotic uh, in the way that Lawrence is. Uh, I needed him to to have to suffer sort of indirectly. And this is kind of also the book where Temeraire really starts to grow up a little bit and really start to understand human society um, and start to see that he can't quite afford to be as um, naive as he has been about human society. Right, as he becomes, in a sense, more part of human society right. from a lot of the things that happen to him in the book. Right. He has to start taking on more and more responsibilities. Exactly, too. exactly. And, you know, Temeraire um, is. Dragons, I think, in general, in, in British society, have not, ha not become part of human society, partly because humans didn't want them there. Um, and partly, also, dragons don't need to worry about human society in a certain way, because they're being provided for, they're being given, all their basic needs are being met. And dragons, I think, are fairly, uh, fairly laid back, many of them, um, because there's not a lot that's a threat to them. Uh, and so they're not, they don't need to be afraid of their environment. They don't need to be anxious. Who's going to, who's going to mess with a 2,000, yeah. you know, with a, with a 2,000 pound dragon? And those are the light ones. Um, and so Temeraire is starting to find why he does need to understand human society and why it is important for him to start to understand politics, um, you know, military rank, organizations, influence, all those kinds of exciting things. Yeah, Beyond yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting journey that they all go through on this. Um, before we run out of time, I want to bring up something else that you do. Yes. That I know is important to you, and this is the Organization for Transformative Works. Yes. Why don't yes. you tell a little bit about so, what that you know, is? Um, I started out writing as a fan fiction writer. Uh, in, I think, 1994, I got on the Vax VMS server at Brown University and found the Star Trek mailing list um, and discovered my first fan fiction, Star Trek Next Generation uh, fanfic stories. And since then, I've written in something like 42 different fandoms. And this is something, that's where I learned to write. Um, and I wrote for years and years purely for love while I was actually working as a programmer uh, and before I ever sat down to write Temeraire. And that's how I learned how to write. So there's a famous line that you have to write one million words of crap before you can, before you can sit down uh, and write something worth reading. And I got mine. You know, that's why this, His Majesty's Dragon was my first novel, uh, why Temeraire is my first novel. And so I, that's really been valuable to me. And I want to sort of acknowledge that and recognize that and encourage people to enjoy fan fiction and to protect it as a cultural activity. Uh, this is done basically by people who are not looking to make money. They're just looking purely to enjoy and participate in these other worlds. And there's a lot of misunderstanding and confusion about fan fiction. People think, you know, a lot of authors are excessively nervous about it. They think, oh, that's going to threaten my copyright. It doesn't. Um, a lot of fans think that fan fiction is, is somehow illegal or in a gray area. We really don't think it is. So we put together the Organization for Transformative Works 
to basically preserve and protect fan fiction and other fan activities. Um, fan vitting is something that's really popular. Fan artists. Uh, you know, I've been really lucky with Temeraire in that there's a, there's a wiki that fans have set up for the books where they collect all sorts of details from the books. I use it as my own reference now. And a lot of artists actually create artwork and put it there to share with other fans. Uh, and that's just, it's such a magical thing, that, that kind of community that develops around a piece of media. And so we really wanted to kind of protect that. And one of the main things that we're doing is building the archive of our own. Um, largely because we wanted a nonprofit organization that was doing this to protect the ability of fans to share their work and communicate about their work and to do it in kind of an organized way where we weren't going to say, you know, yes, give us your content and we'll stick ads on it and make lots of money and if you ever get sued, by the way, we'll yank your story and leave you high and dry to deal with it. Um, which is what's basically been happening in some places um, in, in forums that allow fan fiction or welcome fan fiction. Even though fan fiction is legal um, and we believe is covered under fair use provisions in copyright law. So this is kind of your way to give back to what uh, you yeah, learned from. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, uh, and I, I like to talk about my roots in fan fiction because there are a lot, you know, you'd be amazed at how many writers in the sci-fi and fantasy field have a fan fiction background that they either um, just don't talk about or actively hide. Um, and it, it kind of makes me sad because as a fan fiction writer, I would have been extraordinarily encouraged to know how many other writers had come before me and made that jump to pro writing. And I think that for that matter, editors, this is happening more and more now, um, that editors are starting to realize you go find a great fan fiction writer, they can write you a great They're book. They're a writer. Yeah. 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 And the website is www.transformativefiction.transformativeworks.org. Transformative yes. And uh, people can go look for that. And um, I'm sure we are going to have a whole lot more of the uh, Temeraire and Lawrence books. Um, a few Victory more at Legals. least. Yes. And then any idea when you'll have the sixth one? Uh, the sixth one, I actually am taking a little bit of a break. Uh, the sixth one is not due until August of 2009. Um, and I am going to be <laughs> writing uh, another book in between. Oh. Um, and it, there are two possibilities for what that other book will be. We're still trying to decide, decide between them. Um, but, uh, but after I finish that book, then I'm going to start on, on book six of Lawrence and okay. Temeraire's Adventures. Well, I would look forward to anything that you're writing. So, you. uh, and I want to thank you. I think we're out of time. So I want to thank you very much for taking time out of a busy uh, book tour to well, join us here on Fast it's Forward. So it's always a lot of fun to talk with you guys. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Anytime you want to come back, you're Absolutely. welcome. Absolutely. Thank you. And so from all of us here at Fast Forward, this is Mike Zipser saying take care.